Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about crystal based filters by looking at some practical examples and analyzing the exact response characteristics. I will be looking at some circuits I've built in the past and also look at some design tools. So one of the simplest filters I've ever built is a saw filter for the 70 cm ham band. It's a standalone filter component on a board with some connectors attached and well that's about it. I mean I also made a small shield to house it and to isolate it from external noise. But not much else really to say about this thing. So one of the nice things about saw filters is that based on their design you can find 50 ohm matched inputs and outputs. So in this sort of case there is no more need for any special impedance matching if used in the correct impedance system. And while if the frequency interval for which they are designed suits your needs, you get a very good filter in a very small package. So this particular component, the SF2446E, comes in a tiny 3 by 3 millimeter package. And while this component covers the 70 centimeter band, so it's centered around 435 megahertz and has a 3 decibel bandwidth of at least 10 megahertz. Now, if we look more closely in the various parameters, we will also see some of the limitations of this type of filter. So first of all, if we look at the insertion loss in the pass band, so how much signal will get lost on the filter, for this component it can be as high as 3 decibels. But in other cases, this value can become far larger. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with saw filters is the power handling capabilities. For this particular component, the maximum input power level is 10 dBm or 10 milliwatts, which is not all that much. So even though in certain cases saw filters can be used as output filters, this is only possible in very low power devices. But in my case, this particular component will mainly be used as an input filter. So this input power limitation should not be of any concern. Now, even though there are no extra components attached, it's still important to measure the filter's response. Not necessarily to check the component around which the filter was built, but rather to check the system into which it was placed. Especially at high frequency, the transmission lines and the interconnections used might not be of matching impedance. So that can create deviations from the expected behavior. Now, in my case, I was not paying all that much attention when I created the PCB. And the exact traces, so based on their dimensions, are not exactly 50 ohms. So based on the online calculator of the PCB manufacturer, the impedance is supposed to be somewhere around the 52 ohm mark. So now let's check how the complete system behaves. For that I measured the PCB using a light VNA and surprisingly the results that I got, so the response curve measured between 400 and 500 megahertz, is almost identical to the measurement result from the datasheet. So I guess the impact of the interconnecting lines is quite small in my particular case. Now regarding the measurement, if we zoom out a bit, so here I re-measured starting from 100 MHz up to around 3 GHz, we can see one of the nice features of the saw filter, which is that the pass band, so at 400 something MHz, is only in a single place. So other than the 435 MHz interval, there is no other point on this measurement curve where signal passes through the filter. Now signal will start bypassing the filter at very high frequency, but that's another issue. So anyway, this sort of filter is really good at removing high frequency harmonics. Now in practice, I use this particular filter with my various SDRs. But now when I try to record it to highlight just how good it is, well, it doesn't seem to make that clear of a difference. So right now, what you're seeing is my external ground plane antenna directly connected to a hack RF. And well, if I now mount in the filter, well, there's sort of a difference. Maybe. Anyway, if we try a different SDR, so I also have a RTL SDR. Again, it's connected directly to the antenna without this filter. So this is what our baseline measurement is. And well, if we do connect in the filter, again we see, well, let's say a minimal difference. 
Now, anyway, in general, a filter, even though it does have a bit of insertion loss, it should improve the overall reception quality since it will attenuate out of band strong signals. So that should help to not overdrive the front end of your receiver. Now, the next filter is not something I've personally used, but it is a good example to highlight how the measurement method might impact the observed result and performance. So the component to look at is a 10.7 MHz ceramic resonator, commonly found in FM radios or wherever an intermediate frequency filter is needed. And the particular thing to remember about this component is that it's not usually designed for 50 ohms, but rather for somewhere around 300 ohms, depending on the exact model. So I took the ceramic resonator and directly connected it to a pair of SMA connectors and proceeded to measure it using the light VNA. Now this is a 50 ohm measurement equipment. So that is the impedance that the resonator was seeing at both the input and the output terminal. And while the response curve is not really as expected. So sure, it's centered around 10.7 megahertz, but the shape isn't quite right. I mean, it's supposed to be flat, not to have this sort of ripple in it. And the reason for this being the complete system's Q factor. So the resonator was designed to be connected to higher impedance values. And that is important to get the correct response. So then I looked through the component box, found a couple 220 ohm resistors, recalibrated the VNA, and this time the filter is connected to 270 ohm interfaces. So the port's 50 ohms plus the 220 ohm external resistor. Now, even though the total is still not 300 or 330 ohms, it still gives a completely different response curve. So we no longer see a passband ripple. So both when measuring and when using crystals, and well, any filter for that matter, the connecting impedances need to be matched to what the filter was designed for. Otherwise, you will not get the desired effect. The last thing I want to look at today is crystal ladder filters. Filters built from multiple two-pin crystals in various arrangements. Now, in the past, these were quite common since these offer the possibility of very narrow adjustable bandwidth as well as an adjustable response shape. But in practice, these are quite difficult to build as we will later see. So first thing to look at is a piece of software that can be used to design such a filter. This is the AADE filter design tool. And currently I'm using the 4.5 version. Now, unfortunately, the original creator of this, Mr. Neil Hedge, has sadly passed away. So the software is no longer updated. And while the original AADE website no longer exists, but you can still find this program at various third-party websites. But since this isn't the official website, only download it at your own risk. Anyway, if we go under design, we can see that this tool allows the calculation of multiple LC types of filter, so for various responses, but it also has the option of crystal ladder filters. And here we have multiple topologies and response types to choose from as well as filters created specifically for lower sideband or upper sideband filtration. So anyway, if we just select one of the filter types, let's say the classic Chebyshev, we will see one of the first special characteristics of this tool, something that I personally haven't found anywhere else. The possibility not just to supply the various reactive elements or resonance frequencies of the crystal, but also the series resistance which will impact the minimum bandwidth that can realistically be achieved. So anyway, I will be selecting a crystal that I've previously measured and saved into the tool. And next, we need to select the filter order. So how many crystals will be used? I will just select two for now. The response bandwidth, let's say 8.2 kilohertz. And well, since this is a Chebyshev type of filter, the exact passband ripple that we want. So let's just leave it at one decibel for the moment. Next, the input and output impedances have automatically been calculated. And now we have the option of selecting between different types of topologies. So here we have the option of either using capacitive tuning for the filter and then some sort of matching network or inductive coupling. But for simplicity, 
I will go with the capacitive coupled untuned filter. And after clicking on enter, we are prompted to give some sort of name to the filter and we get the final schematic and the various properties. So here all of the component parameters are displayed and we can right click to create various graphs based on what is of interest. So for example, if we view the voltage effective gain and we just leave the default frequencies and amplitudes, we get the response graph of our filter. So at least the expected response. Now, in all fairness, this is not the most user-friendly tool, but it does offer features specifically related to crystal filters, which I personally was not able to find anywhere else. So if you're trying to design a crystal ladder filter, this tool can be quite invaluable. Now, to make adjustments and testing a bit easier, I took our circuit, so the equivalent model of the crystals and all the capacitors and the interface into LTSpice. And here, if we re-simulate the circuit and we look at the output, maybe zoom in a bit, we can see that we are getting more or less the same response as we got in the tool. And for the moment, even though this filter is working, it's still a circuit that needs an interface to around 200 ohms. So that's why I used a series impedance of 200 ohms in the signal source, as well as for the load. But in the final design, I want to use my filter in a 50 ohm system. So we need to fix that. Now, one approach that you can take is adding in resistors, as we did with our ceramic filter. Now, if we look at this result, we can see that it does indeed work. We are getting the exact same result. So this is quite useful when making measurements, but in a practical design, the resistors will be creating a signal loss. So that's why our graph is shifted down. So it's not really the best choice in a practical, useful design. Now, the other method commonly used is using some matching impedance transformers or tapped inductors to create the necessary impedance matching. So if we look at the result, we are getting more or less the same result as with our reference, even though we are connecting the signal now to 50 ohms. So this works, of course, but the impedance transformers can be quite bulky. Finally, the last method to mention is to create an LC type of impedance matching circuit specifically for the filter's center frequency. So if we look at the output of this, again, we are getting more or less the same response as with our reference. So let's just leave these two for the moment. But this type of circuit also comes with the specific advantage of enhanced attenuation in the stop band. So if we now zoom out a bit, we can see that for the LC matching, so this greenish blue, we are getting a far better out of band attenuation compared to our reference circuit. Now, depending on the LC arrangement, you can increase the attenuation either before or after the filter's center frequency. So depending on whether you're having series inductors or parallel inductors and while the capacitor in the opposing place, and while the best implementation will be use case dependent. But anyway, these are the components that I've calculated for this specific use case. And well, this is the circuit that I will finally build. So we will be expecting quite a lot of attenuation at high frequencies. Now, before building the filter, the first important step is to measure some crystals. And here you will find that even though a set of crystals comes from the same manufacturer and the same production batch, the characteristic values will be slightly different from one unit to another. So one of the most difficult parts of building a crystal ladder filter is collecting a number of crystals with very close parameters. You will typically need way more crystals to measure and sort through than the final filter requires. So from a batch of five crystals that I've individually measured, I selected these two for my final filter. Then I've built everything on a small board. So both the two crystals and the matching circuit have room here. And it's also designed with these side fins so that it can be placed inside of a copper pipe for shielding. And well, when this was measured, the passband response is very similar to what was obtained in the simulation. Now, granted the minimal attenuation was not the same, but this is also in part due to the measurement equipment's limitations. But anyway, if we remeasure over a wider bandwidth, 
So this measurement runs from 1 MHz up to 31 MHz. The more wideband filtration effect of the matching circuit also becomes visible. So again we see quite a good matching between simulation and measurement. Now the final thing that I forgot to take into account when I was creating the simulations was the spurious responses of the crystal. So we can already see here that we have some spikes appearing, but if we make a more zoomed in measurement, so this is from 30 MHz up to 40 MHz, the spurious responses of the individual crystals become very visible. So these secondary jumps in transmission are caused by the imperfections in the components that were used. Now, I guess a higher order filter will not show these so obviously, but here with just two crystals, these responses are not attenuated all that much. The last thing I want to briefly mention today is the difference between a crystal filter built for upper sideband and for lower sideband operation. So how does the use case impact the circuit topology? So upper sideband and lower sideband are types of single sideband modulation. To create these, you start with the basic amplitude modulated signal, which is comprised of a central carrier frequency, as well as two identical mirrored sidebands. Based on what you wish to do, you need to isolate either the lower or the upper sideband. Now, based on what type of crystal filter is built, a series or a parallel type, the response shape will contain a very strong notch right before or right after the passband. So based on which side of the initial AM you wish to filter out, one type or another of filter will be better. So this means that the T or parallel filter will be much better for upper sideband isolation and the Pi or series filter will be better for the lower sideband isolation. So by using these filters on the initial AM signal, you will be able to isolate the desired sideband and will hopefully eliminate everything else. Of course, removing the carrier first will also help quite a bit. In the end, under their various forms, the piezoelectric filters are quite common today. Even if the crystal ladder is not all that widely used, the other implementations like intermediate frequency resonators, oscillator crystals and high frequency saw and similar technologies are quite widespread. Considering the few factors that can practically be achieved, there is nothing really much better than a crystal filter for specific low power applications. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.